If we have not had the opportunity to meet, my name is Tom Fraticelli. I'm the Director of Outreach for Brightview in Southwest and Central parts of Virginia. And that includes uh, Roanoke, Lynchburg, Danville, and now Martinsville. Uh, I'd also like, like to introduce Laura Dugan, who is the Director of Outreach for Southeast Virginia, including Midlothian and Hampton Roads. Hi, everybody. Welcome, thank you for joining. Laura and I will be your MCs uh, for today. We'll kind of get everything going. Um, so right now, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Sean Ryan, who's one of our founders and chief medical officer, and Dr. Nav Kang, who is our chief clinical officer. Thanks, Tom. Uh, appreciate the opportunity for, uh, for us to join you all today and, and for you to make some time for us. It's very humbling. So uh, as Tom said, I'm Nav Kang. I'm a psychologist by training. Uh, I've been the chief clinical officer here at Brightview for about three years now. Uh, spend a lot of time traveling around uh, to our centers, training our teams. Uh, I think you'll find through the course of today's discussion that we're quite proud of the services that we offer, a uh, truly comprehensive on-demand model of care. Uh, I think we like to say we do things a little differently at Brightview and hopefully you get that impression. But I think ultimately, it, you know, if you take nothing else, please also take away our gratitude, again, for you joining us today, because what we hope is that this is the first of a series of engagements that we have with you and your teams. You can just like look through the chat right now and you can see the diversity of attendees and stakeholders that we have joining us today. And so the reason why that is so important and the reason why uh, that is so humbling and tremendous is uh, you know, we all understand, I think, that substance use disorder is a very complex illness. And we understand as a treatment provider that we simply can't be as successful as we want to be with our patients uh, without strong relationships, without strong partnerships with folks such as yourselves. Uh, from the uh, justice system, from hospitals, from primary care, behavioral health providers, uh, social service agencies, et cetera, we need to have strong linkages and, and uh, coordination efforts if we're going to meet our patients' needs and ultimately serve the community the way that we want. So, uh, so a wonderful opportunity uh, for us to connect and for us to all start getting to know each other. But again, hopefully that is that is just the beginning. Uh, prior to coming to Brightview, I worked in the hospital, emergency room, inpatient, and just you know uh, found that if we didn't have those relationships, we didn't oftentimes know what to do with patients, right? If, if they were stabilized in the hospital, where should they go next? Who's gonna take care of them? And candidly, before that, I worked outside the hospital and I always found the hospital to be a black box. So I think in a lot of ways, these types of bridge building endeavors are just so important uh, for us to be able to, to again, serve the, the, the community and, and the folks that we mutually serve in just such a more effective way, right? We're potentiating when we add our, our efforts together, you know, one plus one equals three. So. Uh, I'll, I'll hand it over to Dr. Ryan, who's, uh, who, who, you know, frankly came up with the idea behind Brightview and, and what we're doing here. So uh, he can share a little bit about himself and, and the background from the organization. Uh, thanks, Dr. King. I'll, I'll be brief in, in order to get to the meat of the topic. Uh, you know, as it states here, I, I've done a lot of things in healthcare um, and, and done a lot of education, double boarded in both addiction and emergency medicine. Um, and you know, really came to this topic out of necessity uh, several years ago in the middle of the, you know, kind of crucible of uh, the tri-state of Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky. I'm born and raised in, in Lexington, Kentucky, and then trained in Cincinnati. Uh, and so saw this kind of whole thing unfold and, and realizing, working at a administrative position in, uh, in a healthcare system, to Dr. Kang's point about the black box, uh, and, but also, you know, as an emergency trauma physician for over a decade, just came to understand we needed to promote and elevate the science of substance use disorder treatment, uh, meet people where they're at compassionately and readily. Uh, and that's what we've been doing for this many years. And it uh, appears to be working uh, fairly well, both for individual patients at scale and across uh, several states now, which I never could imagine. Just to be very clear, it was like me in the middle of Cincinnati, like I'm gonna see the people that I see at Jewish and University of Cincinnati in Norwood, because it was in between the two. Like that was my whole plan. Um, not exactly what happened, uh, in, you know, in, in the past several years. Uh, and I was able to convince uh, phenomenal clinicians and administrators like Dr. King to come on board. Um, I agree with him as we've looked, you know, I have had a very broad view of this topic for the past decade. And as we looked at it, the continuum is the key. The reason we're failing our country in treating this issue is because of the lack of continuum. 
the reason is because there hasn't been a system and there hasn't been a focus by our society for the past hundred years or whatever. Um, and we can talk about history another time, but uh, you know, what, what I tell people at a high level is we threw a serious problem at a system that was completely not uh, under designed to manage, right? Um, ironically, we kind of did that with COVID, but managed it much better because we societally committed to the resources necessary, which we are not doing in this. There are not, there's not a play, it's not that there is a, an absence of a playbook. There is an absence of resources to, to bring that playbook to fruition. And, and so the reason I say that is because our partnerships, the only way we're making progress. So our partners, you know, not Brighton Health is not going to do it all. Nav and I have, we spend 16 hours a day out working, but that doesn't matter. We spent 23.9. It's not going to fix it. Uh, so our partners is how we do synergistically make one plus one equals three. That's why we do community forums or broader forums or state forums on strategy to grow because, and I'll finish by saying, I am really tired of telling the next reporter the CDC was right again and it's worse again. And so if I ever get to a point in my career in the next five to 10 years, where I thought we were turning the corner in 1819 and then COVID decided it didn't agree with our progress. Uh, if we ever get to the point in our careers where we can say, hey, it was better at scale. We do see pockets of that, by the way, in areas where Brightview and others have partnered heavily, really put resources at, uh, to, you know, bring, brought them to bear. And we have a presence that is, you know, a significant portion of the community's um, substance use disorder treatment. We see those numbers improving from an overdose perspective. So it can work, a lot of work to do yet, and it's gonna require partnerships. Dr. King. To, to expound on that a little bit. So we'll go to the next slide. We'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the, the statistics or the scope of the problem. Most folks who are on the line with us today, you probably have a good sense of this already. Uh, and Dr. Ryan alluded to, to some of it. Uh, but, but the problem continues to get worse, right? So the first reporting period, 12-month uh, reporting period, where we saw over 100,000 Americans die of an unintentional drug overdose, uh, specifically over 107,000 uh, in the most recent period. So we've had a series of 12-month reporting periods now. We can't keep saying, oh, it's the first time it's been this bad. It just continues to get worse, and we continue to be on a terrifying trajectory over the last several years. As Dr. Ryan alluded to, we just had this pandemic that we've responded to over the last couple of years, but there is an undercurrent or an underlying impact from that pandemic and the response and everything else that we'll continue to deal with uh, into the future. And we're seeing it in some of our behavioral health mortality data, uh, and unintentional overdoses and, and things like that. So, uh, you know, it, important for us to understand uh, where we are on this curve. Uh, and that uh, without an intentional response, it will continue to go parabolic on us. And, and so again, to give some scope, 100,000 Americans who die of unintentional drug overdoses, that's more than, than people dying of gun deaths and car crashes combined. And we talk about those things regularly. Uh, and so uh, uh, you know, the idea of, uh, of providing attention to, uh, to substance use disorder and drug overdoses and overdose mortality yeah, part of it is just about will. Some of it's about bandwidth, right? And we can only have so many pandemics and epidemics going on at one time. But those two other factors, car crashes, gun deaths, they total nationally 70,000. And so the, the numbers in Virginia are somewhat similar. Although what I would call attention to is on the left, you can see some of these pockets, uh, as Dr. Ryan has referenced, that uh, even locally, we can see some improvement, right? And so it's about building a system of care, building a network of care, uh, that translates science into practice and is, is fostered by interagency collaboration. Uh, and so it's so critical for us to get to know each other, again, not just today, but for our team to take care of the member or the patient or the person uh, at the point of care, at the point of interaction, for them to know how to talk to each other, right? So uh, really critical for us to have each other's contact information. And again, this is why we ask things like, put your name and which agency you're in and, and make sure that we all have a way of getting to know each other better because we can make a difference on that curve. Uh, and, and there's really only one direction we can go with it when you stand back and think about it, right? Only about 20 to 21% of people 
with substance use disorder in this country get access to treatment. Dr. Ryan oftentimes likes to call out how for every other chronic disease that's off, that's basically inverted, right? About 20% of people don't get access to quality treatment and the 80% of people do. So we have so much work to do to identify people with substance use disorder and ensure that they're provided with high quality intervention. Uh, but, but as we'll show later and throughout the, the course of the discussion today, uh, you know, these things can work and not just in the frame of reducing mortality. That's the tip of the iceberg. You have to remember that for every person who dies of an overdose, there are 10 people who survive an overdose, right? So it's so 100,000 Americans who die of an overdose. There's a million people who have survived. And so what's their quality of life? How do we ensure that we're making an Im impact in that regard? So we'll talk more about that over the course of today's discussion, but uh, you know, a, a bit of a frame behind what we're dealing with here. And, and uh, also hopefully some, some silver lining that we can actually change the scope here. If we go to the next slide, there's some more local statistics in this regard. I won't read the, the slides to you or anything else, but really every different system that interacts with folks uh, uh, with substance use disorder and specifically opioid use disorder, will see a, a different wrinkle in their own data, but it all you know, has, has trended in, in the same global direction, except where this type of model, this model of care, this model of, uh, of interagency collaboration has been stood up in a, in a dense fashion. There we see something different. There we see those numbers. And this, uh, uh, I'll, I'll pass it over to Dr. Ryan. You can share a little bit about what got us here. Too, right? yeah. we Before we leave this slide, I want to make sure we I make a point based on the, the box on the left, and then give a, a bigger point to the folks. Uh, there's almost nothing, given the size and scope and the expertise we've um, brought to to together at Brightview, that we haven't touched on the topic. And what I mean by that is. As an emergency physician, obviously, I was very focused on the emergency response, but that also included the acute health care all the way through the entire system response. How does that work in primary care from screening? So, like, we we are at the five, right? Like, I still prescribe medications, and the 50,000 or 150,000 of you across our uh, expertise. So, I would, I... I know we don't have much more bandwidth, but I'll always throughout, please do feel free to pass information up through the chain about things, whether it be a state program on ED uh, assessment uh, and, and referral, or it does, I literally just would rather hear that inbound opportunity of any sort or concern if it's communication improvements that need to happen at the local level, whatever. We are trying to maintain that open in, re in regards to our partnership focus that open line of communication and and do have the capability of running something size of a state program we actually built the whole emergency department referral program for the state of ohio with the cdc and such and so on so i just want folks that are on to know that those it interests us from the you know probation officer not getting a good report to the supreme court of the state and how they treat criminal justice and substance use disorder so we we do we do operate in that scope and welcome that information so th this is where we started uh as dr kang said um my mba thesis was in process and flow in the acute care setting the reason i bring that up is i obsessively process map things both in my head and in, in work and this is exactly what the process map looks like for most patients with substance use disorder. Somewhere they hit the health system, often in the emergency department. We do some non-science-based, we broadly the country, do some non-science-based intervention on the right. Um, and a little bit of, you know, I wish you would stop doing those drugs kind of situation. I know this is not the situation in every spot now. 10 years, it was literally a 99% accurate statement. Now it's probably 80 uh, hopefully more so. We don't always know every uh, program that's been um, stood up, but by and large, still way too much of the minimal, insufficient, uh, lack of uh, efficacy intervention on the right. Give them a pamphlet. It does nothing. They don't get to where they're supposed to go, wherever that is, if it even exists, and they come back. They run through this circle until they fall out of it, in one way or the other, whether that's jail or death. And this is what 
I couldn't deal with and why I've said, oh, I'm just going to start a clinic in the middle of the two hospitals I work at and stop it. I'm going to put an X in at least one of these arrows. And that's really what needs to be understood across the country. There are things that we've done which are interesting uh, to put more legal impact, um, financial impact, whatever, to disrupt this cycle. Example, if you're not aware, the Legal Action Center and myself and a few others worked on a brief that said that it's an EMTALA violation to treat somebody like this if they come in for OUD or alcohol use disorder. Why did I agree with that and, and write with them on that brief? Because it is. If a person comes in with a heart attack and I tell them, yeah, you should probably stop eating cheesecake and maybe walk a little further and discharge them, I'm getting sued and the hospital is getting in trouble and everything else, right? Or if I don't even assess them, worst case, like if I just basically don't give them a good assessment, I don't even know they had a heart attack. I'm like, oh, you have chest pain? That seems painful. See ya. That is an EMTALA violation. So um, we have worked to disrupt this cycle, both at the very high federal legal opinion level, but also on a day-to-day -day basis at the person level. And that's where I think working that whole spectrum is how you end up putting X's on all of these things or broadening the arrow in one case um, and end up making a difference. Uh, does that make sense to folks? This is, we often call Brightview different names that are, you know, we're a substance use disorder treatment organization, right? That's one, but uh, a barrier destruction uh, group uh, is another. And that is, uh, I was working just on uh, Wednesday morning with our team on Medicaid enrollment barriers for our patients so that we, they could continue getting care with us and others. And that barrier disruption, uh, you know, um, destruction is, is huge to setting this cycle in the right um, motion. Next slide, please. I talked about all this. I'm not really going to belabor this other than all of these things we talk about and work on are data-driven. I have uh, both an obsessive reading and calculating problem, uh, as Dr. Kang knows, and we think something, immediately try to understand what the data is behind it. Or we see data, try to think about how do we fix it. And there are so many studies about all the stuff I've been talking about at a broad scale. These are some of the points. People that hit the emergency department don't get help. I already said it, right? But there's five, 10, 20 studies that say that, and they die. So not that they don't get help and it's okay and they get help later. Um, it's not, you know, what we're doing is not working. Uh, these are all data-driven points. And I'll punctuate this slide by saying the ecosystem, I'll repunctuate what we said before, the ecosystem and our partnership is critical. If we don't have an engagement with criminal justice, this doesn't work for probably a third of the patients as far as we can tell from the data, right? If we have a disconnect on treatment plan, communication, flow through the jail, prison, spider web that some folks go to, I've worked in those places, by the way, I know exactly the challenges of good treatment in and out and, and in between. Uh, but if we don't collaborate on that ecosystem, it's not gonna work. And again, Dr. King said, you, it's not like we're looking for something that doesn't exist. The treatment ecosystem for other disease states is pretty well built. If you fall out, you're trying pretty hard or just disregarding the attempts. This is the flip side. Patients have to try their butts off to stay in the system, in the treatment framework and get to recovery. And that should sound wrong, right? Like we're pulling every diabetic as hard as we can to, to do better and improve their numbers, make access everywhere, medications, improvements, et cetera. And we are wholesale putting up the you know, wall of China between patients and treatment. And I'll, I'll say this, just think about the barriers that are being looked at with OTPs and certain medications. I often tell people, if you told me, Dr. Ryan and Sean, you had to be somewhere six days a week for 90 days at 6 a.m., I would ask you if I was going to die otherwise immediately, because I don't know that I could do it. And maybe still, I won't know if I could do it. Um, and so that kind of barrier in, should sound a little bit uh, you know, more than challenging for patients. And it reiterates how important that ecosystem is because that barrier is a long, it's its own lecture, like that singular rule is its own lecture and conversation, which is being looked at at the state and federal level. And it's 
can't be obliterated because of the risks on the downsides uh, of not controlling those medications. Um, but we're far and away from meeting the patients where they're at, um, given the treatment continuum that currently exists. Uh, again, not gonna necessarily uh, reiterate all these points, but these are the external challenges I'm talking about. Um, and I think at a patient and system level, as does Dr. King, a lot of our team in regards to, and I will even say, the motivation to get treatment for patients is a very complicated concept. As, and so the more barriers that are presented, the less likely. Uh, and that's where I think from a stigmatized standpoint, people see folks not achieving treatment and recovery and think, ah, they're just not trying hard enough. And I have, even for physicians, a lot of them educated them on, well, let's talk about what you mean by they didn't try hard enough. Like, let me give you their scenario, talk through it. And if you could do it, well, maybe we'll have a different opinion. Um, and I just saw a question pop up about relevant data. Any, you know, happy to share this presentation, happy to answer any questions. I would tell you that Dr. King and I, again, compulsively data seek, both internally and externally, on things all the way to a granular level as in regards to things like dosing of our medications. What papers exist on what is the right, best medication dosing? What are we doing and what is the outcome of that action? So absolutely happy to look at data for any questions folks have. Uh, we wish there was more, I guess. Um, but I will say there on that particular point, I've often heard you know, different scenarios, folks say, well, I'm not sure the data is strong enough. That is not true. I'm not saying there's not serious room for improvement in both the data quality and the treatment uh, pathways and modalities, but there are decades of data as to what we should be doing that we are not doing enough of, we the treatment system. Next slide. Dr. Kang, you want to jump in on this one? Do you want me to continue, sir? I know we can yeah, I think uh, Dr. Ryan actually ended up talking about many of these things. So when, when we think about the, how we, how did we get into this mess, right? I think we just went through a pretty good uh, delineation of what that, what that unfortunate journey has looked like in this country over the last several decades. And so this slide really just summarizes a lot of what we have done to intervene in that regard. Like, how do we remove some of those barriers? Dr. Ryan cited several of them. Uh, and here we just have bullet pointed many of those things out, right? Like answer the phone when people are looking for treatment, they have a life-threatening illness. Let's, let's see about getting them scheduled and getting them in. Right? Take every form of insurance, including uh, understanding that many times people uh, who have uh, a long-standing progressive illness like a substance use disorder might get disconnected from insurance and frankly, everything else. And so you have to take people who have no insurance. Right, uh, and I know we got a couple of different questions during the registration process around insurance and that kind of thing. So happy to expand on that. As you can see, there's some detail on the slide already, but understand the people uh, who you're seeking to treat and, and treat them with kindness, treat their disease like a disease, treat them like people. Uh, and so there's so many things that we can do that are quite fundamental when you stand back and think about it, right? I'm talking about answering the phone and being nice to people. Like these aren't things that should be uh, groundbreaking or revolutionary, but I think as Dr. Ryan illustrated in this space, in the addiction treatment industry, so many of those things have been lacking uh, that we, we do need to specify them, right? Like use the FDA approved medications that can provide stability and brain healing to, to folks with substance use disorder. Uh, offer a comprehensive counseling and therapy program, address social determinants of health. Some of these things, again, we talk about in other areas of healthcare uh, and somewhat take them for granted. Uh, but, you know, we're applying a similar logic here with the same kinds of expectations that we have in, uh, in the care of folks with other disease states uh, and just translating them into addiction medicine uh, in a way that, frankly, just hasn't been systemized in this country. So uh, how, how do we start to break the cycle? Is, uh, is remove those, bar those barriers and, and frankly do the opposite of what we've been doing for, for far too long. If we go to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, about our, our services here for a bit, starting with the continuum. So many times people ask us like, what is it exactly that you all do? Uh, how many beds do you have and that kind of thing? So 
Uh, we don't offer residential or inpatient services. When we look at the uh, continuum of care that, that you see on the screen, the, the level one, the level two, we're not yet licensed in Virginia for the intensive outpatient service. That uh, application is in process. Uh, however, we have the capacity to see people every day if we needed to, right? So if the patient came in today uh, and we did the, uh, the intake with them, that includes a medical service, that includes counseling. Uh, we begin the care coordination process as well. Uh, we typically like to actually see the person back the next day because many times, as you can imagine, some, many of you know, patient comes to us in a, in a you know, relatively subacute state. There are so many things that are potentially going on that we need to address, so many of those barriers that need to be removed even for things outside of the, the you know, addiction treatment kind of space. Uh, so we'd like to have the person back tomorrow. But if the person needs to come in every day, and we have some patients that do this across the Brightview system who come in for an hour, a couple of hours, check in. Uh, some people just like to sit in the waiting room, but slightly different kind of thing to just feel like they're in a safe place. Uh, but for actual service provision, to see a medical team member, to see a therapist, you know, the, the idea that we can uh, treat people in quite a robust capacity, uh, even in the you know traditional outpatient space, I think needs to be understood. Um, you know, combination of nursing services, counseling and therapy, medical care, et cetera. Uh, overall, why do we focus on the outpatient levels of care? It, you know, if we look at federal data or national data, we, what we see is that minority of people need those higher levels of care. Uh, and now when they need them, they oftentimes need them and, and sometimes quite urgently, like in the case of someone with complicated alcohol withdrawal, a history of complicated alcohol withdrawal, that medical emergency, you know, there, there should be a knowledge base at the hospital and the emergency room inpatient, et cetera, to be able to take care of that person. But ultimately everyone needs outpatient care. If we believe that substance use disorder is a chronic relapsing medical condition, again, oftentimes lethal, uh, the, the chronic and progressive component to it means that we need to offer chronic disease management, right? That's typically available close to home, accessible in your community, uh, a place that you can physically get to, uh, delivered by people who look like you, who understand you, who are from your local community, right? It needs to be able to fit into your life such that the uh, other things that you want to do with your life, like attend to your family and go to a job and volunteer or engage in activities, all those things fit in, uh, not just because uh, of how treatment is accessible, but that's all part of the recovery process, right? To have, to have a fulfilling life where you're uh, contributing and having a sense of meaning and belonging and what have you. So, yeah, you know, I think we, we really wanted to focus on those levels of care where uh, we can meet the most people, given the millions of Americans who have this unmet need, uh, and do that uh, uh, with a sense of urgency, because speed to treatment is so important, accessibility to treatment, and retention in treatment is so important. 30 days in a bed is not going to cure anyone. It's necessary to stabilize some folks for a week or 30 days or whatever it is. Uh, but again, that's a minority of people, and, and really the the largest impact that you can make with that sense of urgency within this outpatient space. So that's where we focused historically. Doesn't mean that we won't look in other areas uh, or other levels of care, by the way. We've actually spent quite a bit of effort over the last several months uh, to, to look at residential or recovery housing and what are the different permutations of that that right, you could offer in the future. But the, the outpatient space is so lacking and so many people need that urgently that that's where we've really focused our efforts and and I think become quite expert. In. If we flip over to the next slide, then uh, we'll start talking a little bit about our uh, actual care of patients. So Dr. Ryan will talk about our medical team and our medical care. I'll talk a little bit about our clinical services. Uh, thanks, Dr. Kane. Um, so I, I did talk a, a little bit about this, but I'm going to expand on the fact that we, you know, we're very proud of the extensive experience of our medical staff that are MD, DO, NP, PA, RN, uh, and the hundreds of years of you know, addiction care we've provided both for Brightview as well as previous to and other um, aspects and careers. Um, and the reason I say that so proudly is because not, does, not only does it give us a network of expertise, but training, reflection, communication. We use Microsoft Teams for everything in the company. But one of the coolest things I think that we use it for is medical consultation that folks can get with uh, individuals like myself who've been with the company for several years and have both years of addiction care experience as well as years of kind of institutional knowledge of how we do it. 
Um, and the reason I think that's such an important uh, aspect of, of this conversation is because I want folks to know that don't know our treatment planning and our care focus, that when we make a medication or medical plan as a component of the medical, psychological, and social uh, triangle we deploy, that it, it is not haphazard. It is in the patient's best interest. It is with respect to our oath as physicians and other medical practitioners to do the patient no harm. And it is, uh, you know, it's what we have to do as a you know, fiduciary responsibility for the patient uh, provider relationship. We do, uh, you know, I, like I said, compulsively follow the evidence. And if new evidence comes out, we look at that and we evaluate it with our current practice and treatment uh, planning. Uh, you know, and, and change directions, uh, both at the patient level and at the broader organization level on what we're focusing on. Um, we do trial new devices and medications, whether they be implants, injections, uh, periauricular nerve stimulators that help with withdrawal. And so I think we wouldn't be able to maintain that level of expertise if we didn't have such a broad and connected network that constantly surveilled the evidence such as things like the Surgeon General's report that came out in 2016, where I was privileged to present in, in Los Angeles with him um, and talk about the fact that if you follow the science, it works and it does everything, not just treat the person's physiological issues, but the impact of the physiological normalization resulting in less substance use, less overdose, also reduction. And again, this is the not just the medications, but the broader comprehensive program reducing associated criminal behavior, transmission of infectious disease, et cetera. It's all one kind of program that works together to achieve these things. Um, but we do want folks, folks, our partners, whether they be in referral networks in the health system, legal system, whatever, to, to know that we do not take our medication and medical treatment planning lightly uh, and that we, on the front end, research it and deploy it. On the back end, measure and track outcomes of it uh, because it's that important. So. Uh, you know, we, do, we teach a lot. I've taught thousands of folks about medication assisted treatment or medication for opioid use disorder, or whatever term we are, medication for addiction. There's lots of terms out there now. Uh, we, do, we do a lot of teaching and, and welcome that. And in particularly in those who are um, less naturally informed about it and more in the less in the medical space, more in the public other space, we, we want to talk about it because folks have some misperceptions for sure. Uh, around the, the medical treatment plans uh, that both are out there and that we deploy. And we want to make sure that's a transparent conversation that is based in the patient's best interest for overdose and mortality reduction and long-term recovery. Next slide. So I think, I think to, to be clear with some of these things, right, because we are quite new for some of you. Some of you are on the call today because Brightview has just opened in the last month in your community and you're like, who are these people, right? And so for us to, to be clear is I think important. Uh, we offer comprehensive treatment on demand. That means a person can literally walk in right now and they will be seen by our medical team, by a prescriber who can initiate medication treatment for that patient if that's warranted based on their disease state and their clinical presentation, right? So the prior slide I think had the on the medication statistic on there. That's actually less than an hour in most of our facilities. As we operationalize more opioid treatment programs across the Commonwealth, we'll have that, that level uh, of availability. And that's not just for medical care from our prescribing team, right? As Dr. Ryan said, our medical team is also encompassed by nursing services, pharmacy. I mean, like comprehensive team. We have well over a hundred prescribers on this team uh, so many addictionologists board certified with effectively hundreds of years of experience on that team, right? But at the same time, the comprehensive piece comes into play. We're also offering that level of clinical and therapy services, right? So care coordination, uh, addressing social drivers of health, ensuring that the patient has a therapist that they're meeting with on an individual basis, group therapy, et cetera. So as you get the IOP license in, in play, then that will also further augment that ability to do even more robust group therapy. If you, don't, if you don't know what IOP is, it's basically eight to 12 hours of group therapy per week. So it is, it is quite intensive. Again, we can approximate that, that, you know, uh, that level of engagement by having someone come in more often for medical and, and counseling services if that is really uh, beneficial to the person uh, in the interim. But, but I think it's necessary for us to be that clear that like, yes, the person can come in today, 
and we will see them today by that entire team. And then we'll see them again tomorrow with that entire team. There's not some artificial capacity to just intake people and then not see them again for a month. Uh, but again, it's typically our preferred norm is to literally see people two days in a row and then weekly thereafter, if not more often based on their, their need and their presentation. So we have found that this comprehensive model is really potentiating. Again, just like our partnerships and relationships, the one plus one equals three, logic applies in the uh, actual treatment provider set uh, uh, setting. And so, uh, yes, we use the ACM criteria. Uh, Dr. Ryan and I both do work for ACM, including uh, there's a few of us at Brightview actually now who are participating in the writing of the fourth edition uh, uh, of the ACM criteria. So not only do we use it, but we're contributing to the next edition, which will be out uh, next summer. And again, all, all of this is just us following the science that, that, that indicates that Substance use disorder is a, uh, an illness that uh, stems from biological, psychological, and social risk and protective factors. So someone develops a, an SUD based on many of those risk factors. We should be addressing those things, offering medical, psychological, and social service interventions to be able to take good care of them. So all that sounds really uh, fancy, I think. If we go to the next slide, we can talk a little bit about how this, uh, you know, how this stuff starts to work. Uh, we'll skip over this slide as well since I already talked about it. Um, we take a quite diligent approach towards measuring our patient outcomes and publishing on this topic as well. So I'm not going to read the slide to you here. There's uh, some information that you can find at breadviewhealth.com slash research. Uh, we're in the process of developing uh, uh, peer-reviewed publications as well that will obviously need to be submitted to journals for acceptance and that kind of thing. But our desire to contribute, provide robust statistical analysis as it pertains to how our patients do uh, and where we need to do better as treatment providers and as a treatment ecosystem, uh, that, that is just getting started, frankly. And we've, we've already done quite a bit in this regard. We had a peer-reviewed uh, submission that just went out uh, last week, two weeks ago, actually. So, uh, so what happens for our patients, right? Uh, what we find is that as they engage in the brand new treatment program, their lives transform in every way that we can measure. Right? So they're less depressed, they're less anxious, they're sleeping better at night, they're using the hospital emergency room and inpatient space less for medical, for psych, uh, for substance use disorder reasons. People are spending less time in jail, right? So less nights in jail literally translates to more nights with your family and is less of a cost burden on the, uh, on the rest of the systems that folks may interact with. Many of our patients are working uh, uh, for the first time ever. That process usually takes a little longer. It's closer to six months with many of the other changes, all of the other changes that I'm describing actually tends to transform with about just 90 days in treatment. Right? That's how effective a truly comprehensive science-based model of, of treatment can be. And, and you know, when I say that there's a change that we see, we're talking about p-values with 14 zeros associated with them. If you're a stats nerd or of any kind, right, you'll know what I'm talking about. It is extremely statistically significant relationship between meeting your goals and as a patient and engaging with the Bright new treatment program. So I'm very proud of that fact. Uh, and I think is, is one of those things that uh, we, we seek to continue measuring in as robust of a manner as possible. Like, yes, it's important to look at patient satisfaction and that kind of thing, but there's so much more that we should dig into uh, to ensure that our patient's quality of life is improved and, and their integration with their community is, uh, is, is fostered. Now, if you don't mind, just a, a couple of points. I want to take us to a specific patient and, and mention one tangent and then answer a question that just came up. We had our five-year anniversary right now at the, um, at the site in the center of Cincinnati, which was one of, is our biggest and, and where I, I still go a lot. Um, and a lady stopped me and said, she now works for uh, an addiction services recovery organization where they connect patients to care. She stopped me and she, she said, you probably don't remember me, but four years ago, you all admitted me here, got me in the door in an hour or two or in the door immediately and got me seen by the comprehensive team, medicated to feel better. And I have not misstepped in four years and I'm here working my own place, you know, continue to recover my life or whatnot. Now that's a wonderful story. And it was very impactful for me and Nav to sit there, you know, what she told us that after that, during that anniversary, when we're looking at all these numbers and I'm like, that's really why I'm here. And the reason I bring that up is because that's the, the culmination of what we were talking about. We did exactly what we said we were doing. We were there, we saw her quickly, ready access, appropriate care, and it worked for her. 
I wish, of course, I wish that was every patient's journey. It's not. That's why these numbers aren't 99 to 100 percent, and that's okay. That's recovery is it's, uh, is a journey, and 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 perfection is the enemy of good here. But I wanted to tell you all that all this talk does come down to those uh, points, uh, and and make sure that I um, kind of you know use that impact for folks to recognize that it it does work. Uh, I want to answer one question and give you guys a small tangent that I forgot to mention. The transportation question is its own lecture, by the way, so I'm not going to like go all the way down that rabbit hole. I will tell you, we do everything we can. Uh, we have trials going on with uh, platforms that, um, that kind of bring together mass transit, Medicaid transit, Uber, Lyft, et cetera. So our team, I, since I started in the field, could read the data that said the number one reason people don't stay in treatment is transportation. It hasn't been any different for a decade or probably ever uh, that it's been measured. And so there is not a, there's not an ultimate fix for that to hit the end point of the question. There is constant barrier evaluation and optimization that usually ends up being like, you know, we're working to patch it together and I don't, we don't have a better answer. There's not a better answer because transportation is its own like topic of the, of the country and just happens to have large overlap with the failure of, of addiction. So I just want to get to that question and tell you, we work on it literally all the time. Uh, on that point, I will tell you the first time we started really getting how, how deep we got into it, our CEO, Chad Smith and I, trying to figure out what was wrong with Medicaid transportation. So we just started interviewing them. Like, what does your process look like? Is it a notebook? Is it a, is it a smart device? Is it a, you know, I don't, you guys call each other and tell them where we, and we found all versions of that to be mostly dysfunctional with one that was using an actual transport platform. And so we, I promise hundreds and thousands of hours on transportation that we've spent and we'll continue to do so. I did forget to mention, by the way, I do want to make this connection for folks. I spent years farming in Abington, Virginia on my grandpa's farm, which I did not mention. Uh, I actually had nicotine poisoning when I was seven because they forgot to give me gloves when I was planting in the, whatever that device is called. So I have spent my fair share of time in Virginia over the summers um, and, and, and had a, you know, have a really warm place and special place in my heart for that. Next slide, please. Thank you, Dr. Kang, or Dr. Brian and Dr. Kang. Um, so we just want to talk a little bit more about, you know, we've talked about the importance that we place on removing the barriers to care and what this looks for like if you have clients that you are trying to help get care, our 24-7 patient access center, that means if a client can call us at two o'clock in the morning and we can get them scheduled to come in the next day when we open. Um, they're going to talk with a live individual and our goal is to answer calls within 60 seconds. Um, the walk-in capa capability, if you have a client that you're seeing in your office and they're ready and they wanna come get help, if they can get to one of our sites by three o'clock, they will be seen that day. And as mentioned, um, treatment within four hours, we can do online scheduling which can be helpful, again, if you want to help one of your clients uh, get an appointment, get it done online. If you're going to want information us to report back to you, the ROIs on the online scheduling tool, get that all taken care of. And we also have the capability to do telehealth visits. Next slide. So ultimately we're about outcomes and uh, part of the proof of those outcomes is that we asked um, 325 of our patients some anonymous questions uh, for them to kind of give us a little bit of feedback. So the first question was, what did your friends, family, or community most misunderstand about recovery? Yeah, thanks, Tom. And, and a couple of the responses that we've gotten are, we are not bad people trying to get good, just sick people who want to get well, as well as how much you depend on others for support in recovery. The second question was, what keeps you in recovery or what helps keep you in recovery? And some of the responses, I was tired of being tired. I had reached rock bottom, homeless shelter, lost my wife, kids, house, career. I either had to change or die like the rest of my friends. Dying didn't sound like too much fun. And I would have died without their help. 
And then the final question uh, that we highlight here is how would your friends and family say you've changed the most during your recovery? I am more honest and dependable. I'm finally contributing positively to society and I actually want to live and have begun to love me. Great responses. So this is a map showing our locations in Virginia. Um, our first location was in Chesapeake. We opened last summer. And as you can see, we've grown. Uh, our Fredericksburg site is scheduled to open next Monday. I think I saw some individuals from that area. If you have clients that are ready to get care and we can see them next Monday, please give us a call and then our next site we, is scheduled to open in Prince George, and that will be toward the end of August. All right. Uh, so one of the main questions that Laura and I face and, and the most of our team faces is what are the best ways or what are ways that we can refer patients? And the, there are three main ways. The first is using that 833 number, which is a toll-free number. Sometimes that gets confusing for folks, but 833 is a toll-free number. It's available 24-7, and it is actually answered by a live specialist. It's available there 24 hours a day. They will go through the process of scheduling the patient, helping the individual. Uh, if you are a referrer, they will, you can sit there with the patient and go through that entire referring process. Uh, they can help line up that transportation and then answer any questions. The second way is going online, brightviewhealth.com. There's a nice, easy way to go through and put all the information that, that you need in there. Again, it's something that the patient can do by themselves, or if you're able to, you can actually help the patient go through that process and put all, everything in there and schedule an appointment for the, the same day or the next day. They'll also get text reminders and other information about the appointment details. The last piece is the walk-ins. We take walk-ins Monday through Friday all the way up until 3 p.m. Uh, and it doesn't mean that if somebody comes in after 3 p.m. that we don't see them, we actually will begin the process, but they may have to return a few additional times. Uh, normally we like to do uh, during the induction process is they come in the first day, they return the second day. Uh, if you come in after 3 p.m., it might mean they have to return for a third consecutive day for us to, be, to make sure we got through everything uh, in the process. All right, so our couple of things just to kind of keep in mind is our mission is delivering life-changing addiction care in the communities that we serve. Uh, and our vision is to make a meaningful impact in addiction treatment outcomes. Right now we're serving over 50,000 with a target towards serving 50,000 individuals uh, between now and by 2027. Uh, our values uh, use the acronym RISE, which stands for respect, inspiration, service, and excellence. The respect is that we treat uh, our patients with dignity and kindness and the respect that they deserve. The inspiration is that we hope to inspire transformation uh, by helping others invest in themselves and igniting that opportunity for growth. Service is that we're one team uh, with a shared vision. Again, we work urgently and diligently uh, to provide our promise to patients and our communities. And lastly is excellence. We're committed to excellence in all that we do uh, and we earn our reputation by doing what is right and taking responsibilities for those actions. Right now, um, I'll, we have a couple of questions. So this is the time that if you have a specific question that you'd like to enter in or take yourself off mute to ask that, we have a couple that were sent in um, as we got going. And the first one of those questions is, um, how are resources being extended to effectively service individuals who are homeless and have addictions? Yeah, I can take that question. I think this is why our connection to the community is so uh, necessary because uh, it's important for people to know about the availability of the service level, like what we're describing here at Brightview, right? And so, uh, you know, our community outreach team finds people in any uh, context that you can imagine, right? And, and uh, Tom and Laura can certainly speak to, to the, you know, some, some examples of that, but uh, knowing, uh, you know, some of those circumstances, I'll tell you, our, our folks are out there beating the pavement, making sure that people are aware uh, about what, uh, uh, what Brightview is able to offer, but so are so many of you, right? Again, if we just glance quickly through the attendee list and it's like, yeah, there are folks who are interacting uh, with, with potential patients, individuals who are homeless, who 
have a substance use disorder. And so there are so many ways that, that you then can facilitate their access to us, 24 seven call center, the uh, website scheduling. Basically, if you have someone in front of you uh, who needs addiction treatment, that person can leave your interaction with an appointment in hand at Frankie. And uh, they could even just walk in, right? And so that, that uh, message needs to get out there. There's a, again, a hopeful uh, uh, characterization there that yes, treatment hasn't been available in so many communities. Again, there's a very diverse audience geographically as well, but in some places there's been a lack of treatment altogether for years. And so it, it uh, may be surprising to some that this level of service is suddenly available. And so that's collectively on all of us to get that message out there and that kind of thing. Uh, I want to give a punctuation point in the answer to the question about virtual treatment. You know, I, I think uh, homelessness, again, another societal level issue that we can't cover today, but I will say that, you know, by treating substance use disorder, which a large percentage of homeless folks have, you can reduce the resources necessary for homelessness in the first place. So it's a it, it's, it's not a chicken and egg necessarily, but it is a solution to some component or percentage of homelessness and homelessness resources in communities because several of those folks are homeless because of their cycle of addiction. So it's one of those things where we can, um, it's hard because if they're homeless, getting them to stay on their medications and treatment, et cetera, is, is not that easy. That's why Dr. Kang mentioned us collaborating with partners, looking at recovery housing, et cetera. Uh, very familiar with the topic and that's why we employ and deploy folks that are in the social services case management, depending on the state case management and other uh, folks that try to, you know, if the person is capable of receiving the information, leading them to uh, what resources are available, which they may not have even been capable of looking at before. In regards to virtual treatment, very interesting topic. Again, probably an hour on that, which we can't spend today. I'll say uh, the jury is out a little, uh, if not substantially. Uh, groups like ASAM and Medicaid plans, and Medicare are all looking at uh, virtual treatment. Uh, the caveat or cautionary tale I'll give you is that the way a lot of telehealth and virtual only, we do telehealth at Brightview, we do virtual care, but it's more of a hybrid. But those that only do virtual care, the data they're producing and publishing is not solid. I don't know how else to tell it other than to be clear. Um, I'll give an example. Uh, the toxicology drug testing that we use at Brightview is 99.9% .9 accurate and is the gold standard. The testing that is used in many of these virtual care programs, if it's even done, is not that. Or it's self-report, uh, which has got its own set of errors uh, and inaccuracies. And so uh, the question about data collection research is complicated. It's ongoing. It will demonstrate itself but I would encourage anyone to be cautious of leaning too hard into that. It does fall into the group of something is better than nothing. And what I mean by that is like, if it's such a rural area that there's no way the patient's getting anything else, blah, blah, blah. We can talk about a harm reduction kind of segment of treatment that is applicable, uh, but they are not apples to apples. Uh, and Brightview is fully committed to the hybridization uh, to reach folks without completely giving up on the ability to accurately meet and assess the patient. Um, maybe one day we'll have, you know, great virtual outcome measurements that are not self-report. But if you've ever seen uh, the John Oliver piece where he call, they called the guy and said, are you still drinking? And the treatment center called the, the patient and said, are you still drinking? And he said, no. He then in the interview with John Oliver said, I was drinking while I was on the phone. Hey, that's not exactly accurate. So. Be, be a little cautious uh, of the purported outcomes and collection of data in that environment. I hope that, that makes a sense. That's definitely not my question. What's the best way to start a conversation is on Laura and Tom. Can you address uh, a little bit about insurance coverage, Medicaid and payment plans for the uninsured? Yeah, uh, I'll address that quickly because we're running out of time. Um, the answer is we take it all. And we take it all kind of without really consideration of how that ends up in our um, revenue system. So what I mean by that is since day one, we really never turned anybody away. I hope we can maintain that strategy. That's based on a system of care where we are reasonably reimbursed and allows us to translate that to indigent care. There are some states where the reimbursement is so bad 
that it's, you know, we may not be able to maintain that strategy forever, but today, and I hope forever, <laughs> um, that our CFO will continue to, to agree, uh, it's anything and everyone. What's helpful on that is, you know, we do have to cobble together, and there's, I have a colleague named Dave who is helping with this stuff. We have to cobble together kind of two pieces to make that work. If a patient is eligible for insurance, we got to get them on it. We got to help them get on it. They got to fill out the paperwork. Our partners in different systems, whether it be healthcare or county based uh, resources like JFS, uh, can get patients. That is super helpful uh, to us. We won't turn the patient down or dismiss them like some places do, but please understand like, you know, nobody that's working with the brightviewhealth.com email for me today is taking IOUs for their paycheck. So since that's not the truth, uh, we got to you know, maintain this strategy. And so our partners can really help us understand the systems we're working in to Dr. Kang's point about that bio uh, kind of bio system and culture. Uh, and we find that sometimes we just like didn't even know an opportunity existed uh, to take more indigent patients or better enroll patients in Medicaid and whatnot. So uh, our CEO calls it picking up the pennies and I agree with him. Uh, and as long as we can continue to pick up the pennies, the answer is we'll, the answer is we will answer the phone and get the patient seen regardless as of today. And does anyone want to address what's the best way to start a conversation to work with us? I think we've got contact information here uh, in maybe the next slide. So we can flip there and uh, can confirm if I'm accurate with that. But uh, our team will be able to, to reach out to you uh, if you've provided your contact information, Micah, or for anyone else for that matter. Looks like uh, someone just shot you an email there too, it looks like. All right. Well, I wanna thank everyone for attending. Thank you, Dr. Kang. Thank you, Dr. Ryan, for taking the time to uh, provide uh, the perspective and, and the update on, on everything that's happening throughout the state of Virginia. Um, we have some additional uh, events that are coming up. So uh, I know Katie has posted some of that information in the chat and uh, please register for those as they come up. And uh, thank you again. Hope, hope you have a good day.